one of the things uh, we realized from being in the same room together, which of course we've missed for the last uh, couple of years, is uh, the serendipity of being able to uh, meet and interact with people you wouldn't otherwise have connected with. Uh, and I've been urging folks um, to introduce yourselves to someone you've never met before. Uh, because these kinds of classroom or conference settings uh, can lead to all sorts of connections. So I, I bring this up because so our, I bring this up because our uh, teaching assistant, um, Mosen uh, just made note of the fact that uh, I'm now apparently part of a grant application or something, and uh, that's not something we would have done over Zoom. Um, and it's also the case um, that uh, Professor Mustafa and I would not have met if uh, we hadn't done a conference together or I had did a conference that he came to. Um, much of, of the work uh, that we're trying to do around resilience and sustainability uh, and the management, really, of, of our environmental future um, entails bringing people together who haven't met with each other. Um, and so it, it's absolutely essential, not only that uh, we come into these sessions for what is being discussed substantively, but it's also essential that you get to know each other. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to um, please introduce yourself to someone you don't know uh, and um, find out what they're doing, because the odds are there's going to be some overlap uh, between what you're doing and what they're doing. And uh, we need to leverage those overlaps. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Ted Landsmark. Um, I'm a professor of the practice within the School of Public Policy uh, here at uh, Northeastern University. And on Wednesday nights, recording in progress. On Wednesday nights for uh, the past couple of years, um, I've overseen uh, this uh, session um, that. Uh, is known as the open classroom, and we talk about a number of policy issues um, varying from semester to semester. And given the immediacy of um, federal funding and uh, state and local commitments to addressing issues of environmental resilience and sustainability, uh, this semester we're taking a, taking a look at uh, those issues uh, of resilience and sustainability. And in particular, uh, as you'll hear in just a moment, we're focusing not so much on some of the broad issues, but uh, digging down uh, into questions of how one goes about assessing impacts of uh, interventions and developing metrics uh, that uh, can help us to be better project managers, better designers, and better policy makers. Um, so uh, with that as a brief introduction to uh, what we're doing here, uh, I will turn the microphone uh, over to my colleague uh, and engineer, uh, Professor Mustafa. I see. Uh, okay, I think uh, it's okay good now. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, good morning. Oh, good, good evening to you all, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, my name is Abdul Mustafa. Uh, I am, um, by training, a civil engineer. I teach within the CPS, uh, and we have a, a program in project management. So. Um, this is kind of a collaboration between CPS and uh, the public um, policy school. And, and the idea is we wanted to uh, enhance um, the learning of, of, of our students from both schools. So we are bringing 
um, policy to our project management, and we're bringing project management uh, to the policy. Um, our uh, kind of objective here is to foster an engagement between um, Northeastern students and practitioners who are um, uh, involved in sustainable and resilience project. And this is better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, our guest uh, today is Anthony Kane, and I'm going to uh, introduce him. Uh, Anthony Kane is the president and CEO of the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure in Washington, D.C., where he oversees uh, organizations for all operations and lead the development of the Envision Framework for Sustainable Infrastructure. He is also a commissioner on the Washington, D.C. Commissions on Climate Change and Resiliency. Anthony was a formerly research director at the Zofnas Program for Sustainable Infrastructure at Harvard University Graduate School of Design a research associate with the Material Processes and Systems Group at Harvard uh, University, and uh, was an instructor at the Boston uh, Architectural College. Uh, and he holds a Bachelor of Architecture uh, from Virginia Tech and a Master's in Design Studies from Harvard University. Anthony is a co-author of Ceramic Material Systems in Architecture an interior design and a contributing author to another book uh, in infrastructure and sustainability. I met Anthony about 10 years ago when Zofna's uh, program at Harvard University started this envision, and he has been uh, very generous uh, uh, with his time. And although he's, uh, he has a lot of commitment, uh, he graciously agreed to come and share with us his experience and tell us the story of ISI and Envision. Uh, so Anthony, um, thank you for accepting the invitations and welcome to Northeastern University. Thank you, Professor Mustafa, and thank you, Professor Landsmark, for the opportunity to, to join you virtually. As, as you guessed from my, uh, from my bio, um, I lived in Boston for a number of years, so a, a place I have a lot of fond memories of, and I'm just waiting most, and if there's a, a chance for me to upload my slides. So um, as I mentioned, thanks for the opportunity to join you. Um, I will just give a brief introduction to the history of the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure, and then an overview of the, the Envision rating system and the impacts that it's having in the industry, especially from the point of view of, of policy and, and procurement. Um, so ISI was created in 2010 through a collaboration of three major associations, the American Public Works Association, which represents many of the uh, municipal public works departments all around the United States and Canada, the American Council of Engineering Companies, which represents the architecture and engineering firms that design a lot of the infrastructure, and the American Society of Civil Engineers, which represents the individual licensed civil engineers uh, throughout the United States. And they are also the largest civil engineering association in the world. So the three of them recognized the transformative effect that rating systems like LEED had had on the architecture and building side of the built environment and recognized that there was not a similar tool and that LEED did not apply to many of the types of infrastructure projects that make up the rest of our built environment the transportation, energy systems, water systems uh, that are a big part of the, the, the world and the communities that we live in. So they created ISI specifically with the goal of creating a way uh, to assess sustainability within infrastructure projects and to develop a rating system that could have that similar transformative effect for our industry. And so today ISI is a hub for the community. We really see ourselves as a clearinghouse. So our membership includes the AEC firms, government entities, primarily local governments, city, county governments, uh, water utilities, power utilities, transportation authorities, as well as a, numer you know, a number of academic institutions, universities, not just within the United States and Canada, but all around the world. And so our goal is to identify where in the uh, process of achieving more sustainable infrastructure, where are the barriers? And where are there opportunities for collective action, shared resources, uh, and greater efficiencies? 
And ISI can be, as a nonprofit, the neutral ground that helps develop those resources and disseminate them through the industry. So that's really how, how we work. Now, I think with this group, uh, I just to set the context of, of where we are with infrastructure, I think these are things you're probably all familiar with, with your uh, knowledge of sustainability, but there are a number of issues that we're facing all around the world. These are not unique to the United States. Imminent threat of climate change, uh, the need for resilience and preparedness for climate change is already occurring, issues of equity and social justice that are happening all around the planet, uh, biodiversity loss, which is in many cases more imminent than even climate change, uh, public health issues, especially in the wake of COVID, and the need for economic recovery in the wake of COVID. But infrastructure plays a critical role in all of these, even just to focus specifically on climate change. When you combine our transportation and energy infrastructure, depending on what you count or how you count, it represents 50 to 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Solving many of these issues will be a, a factor of infrastructure. Now, at the same time, uh, there's a trend in the, the world that's happened. Following World War II, uh, the United States made massive investments in our infrastructure system. Europe made massive investments rebuilding their infrastructure systems. Uh, as well as, as part of the East. And those systems now are reaching the end of their useful life. And so we've seen with the American Society of Civil Engineers report cards, uh, if you're familiar with them, consistent ratings of D, D minus in American infrastructure. You hear the stories in the news about aging and failing bridges, about uh, water treatment systems that are failing. We have not made the necessary investments to upkeep our infrastructure systems. They are reaching the end of their natural lives. And so we had an aging and degrading infrastructure. At the same time and at the same confluence of these critical global issues. And now with the post-COVID world, many governments around the world chose to restart the economy after COVID by making massive infrastructure investments. So here in the US, we have the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. Canada has a major infrastructure investment bill. Europe has the Green New Deal investment in infrastructure. China is making massive investments in infrastructure even before COVID through the Belt and Road Initiative. So there are globally trillions and trillions of dollars being mobilized right now for infrastructure investment right at the time when uh, we need to address these critical issues. So I say that all just to put a, a point on the fact that I believe we're really at an inflection point. Um, infrastructure lasts decades, many decades. So when we think about all of the challenges that we will need to face, you know, looking ahead to what the world's going to be like in 2100, or beyond, and keeping in mind that infrastructure is 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions, that it's a major driver of biodiversity loss, that it's a major player in public health and economic uh, uh, driver. What we do over the next five to 10 years in infrastructure procurement and development will really set the trajectory for societies all across the planet. Um, so this is really a critical issue right now, ensuring that these trillions of dollars of investment go to making the most sustainable infrastructure that we can, that it goes to addressing these challenges rather than exacerbating these challenges. And that's, you know, in a small way, what ISI is hoping to influence and, and contribute along with our partners and many other organizations all around the world. We're all striving for the same goal. Uh, the work that we do around Envision and a rating system is to create a common definition then of what is sustainable infrastructure. So we've, we've established that we need sustainable infrastructure. What is it? How do we do it? Uh, how do we know that we've done it? Uh, the good news is that there is this precedent in rating systems for buildings like LEED, and we know the kind of benefits that they lead. So far beyond the mechanisms of the rating system itself, the, the adding up of points and the getting the awards, just the existence of these rating systems have transformative effects in the industry. So they can lead to greater accountability because now you have a way of measuring performance, right? Uh, they help us understand the complex trade-offs. So just in that previous list, right? I listed climate change and biodiversity loss and resilience. How do you weigh one against the other? They're all important. How, how do you look at how you can contribute to one in a project 
uh, but maybe having negative effects on the other. You need some kind of system or framework. It also helps us prioritize higher performing projects. So even with these trillions of dollars of investment, there are the, the need is far greater. So again, the American Society of Civil Engineers has a study of, of how many trillions of dollars we would need if we wanted to bring that report card from a D up to an A. And even with the Infrastructure Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we're far short. So we're not going to be able to do everything that we wanna do. So how do we prioritize that spending? How do we identify which projects are better or worse for sustainability? Tools like Envision can help with that. Um, the guidance to embed high level goals. So this is very similar, but now drilling down to the level of the project. So when an infrastructure owner says, we're gonna do this project, how do we help them understand the higher level of performance that they can strive to achieve in that project? Uh, our industry is really driven in many ways by minimum standards, codes and regulations. Uh, there, there's a lot of risk in, in going beyond what codes require. And that's, a, it, that's an unfortunate situation. So um, there's a joke I often tell where we're sometimes very proud to say, hey, this project is 100% code compliant. But saying that something is 100% code compliant is like saying, if it was any worse, it would be illegal. So we need to stop thinking of code compliance as the best that we can do. That's the minimum we're allowed to do. And there is a huge range of performance that we can achieve beyond that. Uh, and our industry needs, needs a reason to start striving for more. And again, rating systems play a role in that. And then there's also just the value of a standardized national and international approach. So I give the example of, of how we addressed COVID, uh, when you're dealing with these global challenges, you need a standardized approach. And the, the nuances of, of the approach are, are almost inconsequential to us doing it all together. Um, and so in many ways, having a consistent measuring stick for sustainability is more valuable than the nuances of, is, you know, should it be this or should it be that? But we all need to be uh, comparing apples to apples and moving in the same direction. And then there's finally the systemic changes that we see. So with tools like LEED, when you have this standardized definition of sustainability, it changes manufacturers and how they make products, the data that they disclose. It changes our academic institutions and our curricula and what we teach. And there's all of these uh, secondary and tertiary benefits that come from, from tools like that. So that's uh, no small task, but the goal that we're trying to achieve uh, through Envision is to create some of these uh, systemic changes. So it's far beyond just the mechanics, again, of the rating system and, and getting in a plaque for an award and, and things like that. So now coming to Envision itself, uh, you know, I've already talked about it in, in an abstract term, but we really think of it as a blueprint for better infrastructure. Uh, and I, you know, you can read the bullet points, but I really talk about it as the value of having this common language. So before Envision, you know, there are thousands of municipalities, city governments, again, utilities, authorities, different infrastructure owners, just in the United States alone, thousands of them. And even if all of them were to commit sustainability, they were all starting to develop their own sustainability guidelines, their own frameworks, all very similar, but slightly different, right? And, and that's unnecessary confusion and unnecessary wasted effort in the industry. Um, so standardizing this process, providing a free and accessible tool, um, not only for the, the, the owners who have developed their own sustainability frameworks, but for the thousands of small communities that maybe don't have the resources to develop their own custom uh, sustainability plan or, um, lack the, the skills or capacity to develop their own sustainability plan. So as I mentioned, we really saw an understanding of sustainability as the first barrier to, to achieving sustainability and in infrastructure, and the rating system was our way of trying to tackle that. A unique aspect of Envision is that it applies to all different types of infrastructure. So really, in a way, we almost uh, define it by what it's not, which is, as I told you, LEED was already addressing buildings. So buildings designed for human occupants, residential spaces, commercial spaces, schools, hospitals, all of those were already addressed. 
So we were looking at that part of the built environment that wasn't addressed, the, the energy, water, waste, transportation systems. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it gives you a, a general gist of the breadth of the projects that we have to address with Envision. And you can understand that the, the differences between tools like LEED and Envision are not in the concepts. You know, we're all trying to achieve the same outcome of sustainability, but how those concepts get applied to projects, infrastructure projects is very different. I like to describe it as buildings are very internally uh, focused. They have a clear boundary and you're talking about what's happening inside that boundary. You're talking about, again, the, the benefits to the humans, natural light, the clean air, the comfort of the spaces that they're in. Infrastructure is almost the opposite. Um, it's very externally focused. So it's often not about the space that's being occupied by the physical asset itself, but what it's doing in terms of the larger network of infrastructure that it's a part of, the community that it's serving, uh, the region that it's serving. Uh, and, and many of these spaces are not intended for, for human occupants or for a very small number of, of people. So the system is designed in a different way. Uh, it tackles the same concepts from a different direction, from a maybe higher level, broader view. Uh, and so th those are some of the fundamental differences in the system. As far as the components and the mechanics of the system, it's fairly similar to other rating systems that you may know of. There is the guidance manual. That's really the heart and soul of, of it. Uh, we do have for infrastructure, something unique, which is a pre-assessment checklist. When you think about the very long planning timelines of infrastructure, one of the challenges is that, um, you know, you might come in at a certain point and it's too late. You know, early planning decisions have already set the trajectory of the project, have already decided what type of project is gonna be developed. And so you need a way to really influence those upstream decisions. The pre-assessment checklist uh, simplifies all the Envision concepts into yes or no questions. And is that kind of cheat sheet at the very early conceptual phases of a project to say, these are all of the criteria that you're gonna be evaluated on later, maybe years down the road in, in some cases, uh, but you need to be thinking about them now and you need to be thinking about you know, the type of the project, the contracts, the RFPs that you might issue, specifications that you might write. So that's the, the goal of the pre-assessment checklist. We then also have a professional training and credentialing program. Uh, and we're proud to have over 6,500 active credentialed professionals, what we call Envision Sustainability Professionals. And of course, we do have this project verification and award uh, process. And that's where uh, projects can submit to us. We go through, also we bring in third-party reviewers. We assess the, uh, the project. Well, I should say we assess the submissions and the documentation. And if they achieve a certain number of points, they can get an award. Here, it's interesting that we don't necessarily advocate that every project, every infrastructure project needs to go through the third party verification, uh, but it is there in cases where it's valuable. We often see owners that for small routine infrastructure projects, they'll just use Envision internally for the benefits of having a sustainability framework, but for large capital projects, high profile projects like a new bridge or a new water treatment facility, they'll go through the third party verification for that recognition. And that's often to demonstrate to taxpayers, to constituents that, you know, the owners achieve their sustainability goals and it's not just them saying so that they went through this external review. There's also a value that we see, uh, you know, I often say that you act differently when you know there's a test at the end. So some projects will even commit to the verification program really not for the public recognition, but for the added accountability of knowing that they're gonna be assessed at the end of the project. And so it changes the way project teams think about documentation, about the goals that are embedded in the project. It's a lot easier to let some of those goals slip or fall off the table uh, when you don't have that accountability of a, an assessment at the end. So um, those are just some of the, the reasons why projects pursue, pursue the awards. As far as the system itself, there's probably not enough time today to go into all the nuts and bolts, uh, but it's very comprehensive. Uh, if you're familiar with the three pillars of sustainability, environmental, economic, and social, we cover all of those, but divide them 
uh, in, in a number of other ways with quality of life being most of those social factors, uh, well-being as well as community and mobility. Leadership uh, looks at the collaboration, planning, and then economic impacts of the project. And collaboration and planning are really important for, for infrastructure. So even though they don't have necessarily a direct sustainability connection, they are the fundamental glue that is going to allow you to achieve those sustainability goals. Without collaboration and long-term planning, uh, you just don't have the information and the knowledge and the skill sets to achieve the best outcomes. Uh, in resource allocation, that's your traditional efficiency uh, in materials, energy, and water. Use less, use renewable, uh, use it as efficiently as possible. Natural world is the ecological impacts of the project. And then in climate and resilience, we look at both mitigation of the project's contribution to climate change and then resilience and adaptation to, to climate change. So that's uh, you know a quick overview. I know you probably can't read this slide, but this is just how it unfolds into the 64 different criteria. Uh, and here I'll just note that under each of the five categories, we also have credits on innovation. So we recognize that we can't foresee or plan every aspect into a framework. So we have this flexibility around innovation credits to encourage project teams to think outside the box, to do things differently. Um, that's something we really try to work on as well. Sustainability is about doing things differently. Uh, and that's really tough within our industry. Uh, there, it, it's a challenging thing to overcome the inertia um, of our systems and our governments and our, and our funding mechanisms and infrastructure. Uh, I feel like I have to talk about cost. It's the number one question when it comes to sustainability. And for those who maybe are uh, critical of sustainability, I feel like it's the number one thing that they go to. The argument that sustainability costs more. I'm an adamant proponent against that. Uh, I don't believe sustainability costs more. I think if anything, if you think about the principles of sustainability in terms of efficiency, long-term thinking, uh, reducing negative impacts, it is less expensive in the long run. It's just a matter of how, again, our governance and funding systems draw the boundary around costs and what we count and what we don't count. Uh, but this is a very traditional project management uh, diagram. It's not actually specific to sustainability, but recognizing that as a project goes along, our ability to make changes decreases and the cost to make those changes increases. I believe what we see often with sustainability is that uh, if owners aren't fully committed to sustainability, they keep it as a nice to have, as an add-on. And they say, well, let's go ahead with the project. And if things go well, and if the budget is okay, then we'll add some sustainability stuff at the end, right? Or, or we'll hold it and we'll add it at the end. Well, that means we're designing conventional projects and then just deciding to slap some sustainability features on at the end. And not surprisingly, that does result in higher cost. So it really requires us to fundamentally rethink the project to incorporate sustainability thinking from the very beginning uh, and to integrate it into a project in such a way that it's, that it's not a tack on, that it, the project is itself sustainable. It, it's inherent to the project. Uh, we have the, the, the tagline here at ISI, it's not just about doing the project right, it's about doing the right project. And that really summarizes a lot of what we try to do as far as embedding sustainability and sustainability thinking as early into the project as we possibly can. Many of the projects that use Envision or, or pursue that third-party verification will start off with a, a design charrette around sustainability at the very beginning of the project. And we've seen that as a very successful, you know, an indicator of success, I should say, for, for a lot of project teams, if they have that collaborative cross-disciplinary kickoff meeting. So, you know, what, what are the values of this? I've already talked about the value of the rating system as a whole, but at the project level, we see a lot of values as well, as far as, far as you know, encouraging that multidisciplinary work. Our industry has a history of being very siloed. Um, and, you know, for reasons over the decades, uh, infrastructure systems became siloed, uh, professionals became highly specialized, we were in the, the world of designing very complex centralized systems and, and trying to do that as efficiently as possible um, in terms of costs uh, without really considering environmental impacts. Now we find ourselves in a world where sustainability and the challenges that we're facing are cross-cutting. 
So, uh, you know, the, the rain doesn't care if it's falling on a road or a power station or a water treatment facility, the rain falls on everything, right? And uh, many of the issues that we're dealing with cut across water and energy and transportation. And our governance models, and I said our funding models aren't really designed to, to be nimble in that way and to take advantage of opportunities where a transportation system can be generating energy or a, a water system can be saving energy or an energy system can be producing water. The, uh, you know, that's something that we're just starting to get into and we're trying to break down those silos and those walls, uh, but it's taking a lot of work uh, and we're still, I think, in kind of the infancy of that. But that's where sustainability, I think, is headed. Uh, is interdisciplinary work, cross-cutting work, um, and what we, we call multi-benefit projects. I, I've already talked about, you know, the value of having a common language. I would also say that when projects go through the third-party verification uh, system, one of the uh, interesting pieces of feedback that we get is that it's also just a good project management tool, good project delivery tool. So again, I, I'm kind of uh, hitting on the same topic over and over again, but when you think about the nature of sustainability and how it requires that greater communication, greater collaboration, multidiscipline perspectives, that also just leads to better projects, uh, even outside of the sustainability benefits. It's just a better way of, of managing uh, the work that we do. So it's interesting there as well that I think sustainability is tied up with just a better way of delivering infrastructure uh, and that leads some people, you know, if sustainability is ever a hot button word that, that people don't want to talk about, they'll often talk about quality infrastructure. And that's kind of our, our code for sustainable infrastructure is quality infrastructure. As far as, you know, the adoption of Envision and, and where it is in our, in our progress, um, we're very pleased with the distribution. As you can see, it's, it's all over the United States and Canada. We also have a partnership in Italy uh, that administers Envision in Italy and a few pilot projects in the Middle East. About 140 verified projects representing $135 billion worth of infrastructure. I already mentioned that the 6,500 active credential professionals and the roughly 200 member public sector members that we have. Uh, we're very proud of this, but I would say, you know, keep in mind trillions of dollars of investment in infrastructure. So uh, this is a start, but we've got a really long way to go. Uh, if we're going to, to really try to influence all infrastructure development to be more sustainable. Uh, the good thing is I don't see necessarily a trend between uh, like major cities and small cities or East Coast or Central. As you can see, there's communities all across the country. They see this, they care about it. And that's really been ISI's engagement at the local level. So the city and county governments, I think they really get sustainability much more than, than state and federal agencies do. Uh, because I think it's very close to home for them. Infrastructure is a big part of what they do. And when you talk about the environmental impacts, the economic impacts, the social impacts, that's, that's their community, right? And they care about that, regardless of where they are on the political spectrum. So we've really seen leadership at the local government level. Just one story, you, you may remember that when, uh, when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, it was three or 400 cities across the United States that stood up and signed a pledge saying that they would actually continue with the Paris Agreement, even if the United States wasn't a part of it anymore. So again, leadership, we really see at the local level. Just, you know, if it's of interest as to where that is happening, uh, the largest sector and earliest adopter for us was the water sector. Again, not a surprise because water, environmental, social, economic factors, they've been doing it for a very long time. The next biggest sector for us um, and, and somewhat newer is transportation. Now this cuts across all different types of uh, transportation from airports, transit, rail, roads. Uh, you know, we see, we see it all. And then the newest sector that we're seeing is energy. Uh, and while this is a lot of renewable energy projects like solar farms and wind farms, there's also, you know, coal alternative uh, energy systems like uh, combined cycle natural gas uh, or other types of energy generation systems that, that we're seeing. We haven't seen a lot of energy transmission projects yet, but we're hoping that that will change. And then we have, uh, you know, another uh, slice there, which is the land and environmental restoration projects uh, and, then a, and a few kind of miscellaneous ones in agriculture.
Uh, if it's of interest as far as, you know, again, the distribution of that, many states, these are states and Canadian provinces, as well as a couple of countries thrown in there. Uh, probably not a shock that California and New York and Florida, in addition to being the most populous states, are also the, the largest number of Envision projects, uh, but good distribution across. I would say if you combined all of the Canadian provinces into one, they would be third on this list. So a lot of activity in Canada. So now shifting more on the kind of policy side and procurement side, how is Envision influencing the process of infrastructure? We kind of start at the high level and work our way down. So as I mentioned in Canada, we actually have a federal legislation. So the Infrastructure Canada, which is the ministry that oversees all Canadian infrastructure, they have a requirement that all federally funded infrastructure conduct a climate change mitigation assessment. And then they, they lean on Envision and another framework uh, as accepted methodologies for demonstrating that compliance. So this is a great example where um, by virtue of having these types of frameworks, the government can start uh, upping their requirements without taking on the role themselves of developing these complex systems and maintaining them and ongoing of, you know, what is a climate change mitigation assessment and what qualifies or not. So, you know, they can lean on uh, systems like Envision and others uh, to, to set higher standards. So that's a great example that we, we see of federal government engagement and, and the role of these frameworks. Then at the state side, uh, a couple of years ago, California passed a bill uh, a very specific bill, but it streamlines the judicial review process for environmental transit projects in Southern California. So again, hyper-specific, but this hits on a really big issue in a lot of infrastructure development, which is permitting. So we have these trillions of dollars going to infrastructure. We have this need for infrastructure as we look at the age and, and the degradation of our systems. Uh, but we have a lot of regulations that make the permitting process for new infrastructure projects quite long and cumbersome. And the challenge there is that it's good to have strong environmental and social protections for our community. So we don't want to sacrifice that. But then on the downside, again, we're, we're not getting the infrastructure that we need fast, but even worse, sometimes the permitting process can be so long that the project that you've proposed is now serving a community that's that's no longer the same, right? It's five years or 10 years or longer. And all of the assumptions that you made in setting up that project have potentially changed in that time period. So it, it also makes it challenging to have projects that are addressing current needs and the critical issues of the day, like biodiversity loss and climate change with, with very long permitting process. Like I said, it's a bit of a catch and you'll see people who will fall on either side. This is an interesting compromise where uh, it says that for environmental transit projects, transit projects that demonstrate positive environmental impacts, they can go through a streamlined judicial review process. And what they qualify as having a positive environmental impact is meeting certain requirements of which, you know, a, a, an achievement level within Envision is one of them. They're, they have different options, but if you follow Envision and have these positive impacts, you can go through basically the express checkout line. Uh, and if you don't, then you have to go through the more rigorous review and we can make sure that we still have strong protections for, for our environment, our communities. So it's an interesting uh, pilot of an idea that could address one of the, the major issues that our industry is dealing with. We also see it at the city and county level. So uh, some cities and counties passing resolutions, loosely adopting Envision. Uh, I actually need to update this slide because just this year, Miami-Dade, or end of last year, Miami-Dade County updated their sustainability building program. So there are many cities or communities around the country that already have ordinances requiring that uh, their buildings be, say, LEED certified or meet certain sustainability outcomes. But the absence of a similar framework for infrastructure meant that infrastructure projects were often excluded from those requirements. So Miami-Dade just updated their sustainability program saying that all of their buildings will meet the LEED uh, system and all of the infrastructure will meet Envision. So again, this is a great way of, of building or bringing our 
infrastructure half of the built environment up to the same standards that we were, were meeting with our buildings. Um, St. Petersburg has a similar ordinance requiring envision on all of their infrastructure projects. So I think we'll see more of this. Uh, the, the good news is that again, a lot of the hard work has been done by many of those cities that have already adopted building requirements. So now all we have to say is, hey, if you have a building requirement, you should also have an infrastructure requirement. Funding is, is always a challenge, right? Everyone wants to ask you, do I get more money if I, if I do this? Unfortunately, we don't see a lot of funding tied specifically to the use of, of tools like Envision. This is one case though, uh, that has a lot of potential, the California Department of Water Resources Flood Management Division. Here, you have a challenge where you have a state regulatory body, right, that has a, has a narrow purview of what they're supposed to be regulating and what they're in charge of, which is flood management. But they recognize that, again, with multi-benefit infrastructure projects, taking a, a sustainable and a more comprehensive view of the value that a project can give can deliver better benefits and better value to the residents of the state. Right. So even though some of these things are a little bit outside their purview, what they do is they say, if you meet an Envision Gold or Envision Platinum level, we'll increase the grant fund match by five or 10 percent. Uh, and so we did have a project that, that did this, um, that was a levy project in California, and they received, uh, you know, it wasn't a large project. So I think the extra five or 10 percent for them was was maybe half a million dollars, but it more than covered the the costs of using a tool like Envision and many of the additional features that they added into the project as a result of that uh, to make it more sustainable. So there are great examples there. And again, it's I don't think it's a massive amount of funding that's needed uh, to just tip the scales on a lot of this. Um, most of the time, people just need to know that they're they're um, that they receive some benefit. Right? And of course, we see it at the level of RFPs. Um, and I don't know the, the makeup of the audience, but this is requests for proposals, uh, the most standard way for beginning the procurement process for infrastructure. And sometimes it's uh, the RFP will have uh, just that credential professionals need to be involved in the project to take advantage of their knowledge and skills. Sometimes it'll require that those credential professionals conduct a self-assessment so that the owners uh, know how the project is doing, and maybe that on a later date, they can decide whether they want to go through the third party verification or not. And then sometimes if the owner is familiar with Envision, they'll actually write it into the contract that the consultant will, will take the project all the way through the third party verification and may even stipulate that the consultant is required to meet a certain level. What's also nice is that we see, uh, even though Envision is an entire tool, uh, the way that it breaks down all the different uh, components of sustainability and sets different levels for achievement in each within each of those, it gives the owner a lot more flexibility in specifying achievement. So just for example, um, the New York City Department of Design and Construction, they will say you have to meet Envision Gold, but we also require that within certain credits, you have to do certain activities that are outlined in Envision, right? So they kind of customize the approach to a certain degree based off of their own priorities and what they wanna see accomplished. So it gives the owner a lot more flexibility and, and some resources, I should say, uh, when writing the contract that would be a lot harder for them if they had to kind of come up with that language uh, fresh every time. And then finally, um, we see it working its way down to the design guidelines. And this is really where the rubber hits the road in many cases. And as part of that systemic change that you wanna see, a lot of infrastructure is designed to uh, design guidelines, design specifications, um, certain policies within agencies, and having tools like this can, can trickle down and, and begin to influence this. And this is just one example, but the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, I love telling this story. They, they actually had their own sustainable infrastructure guidelines that were older than Envision, that they developed themselves at considerable cost. And they were one of the organizations that kind of inspired us to do our work because we thought, okay, if the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey uh, had to go through this considerable effort to create their own design guidelines, what are the chances that the smaller agencies out there can do the same? Uh, but just a couple of years ago, they realized that their system needed updating, that they'd have to go through and revise it. Uh, and they ultimately decided to scrap their custom tool, just adopt Envision, 
they they wrote a 20 page kind of bolt on that says you know this is how you're going to use envision in the context of the the port authority projects uh and then they went from there and i was talking to their their director and asked you know why <laughs> why did you do that and he said well you know with their custom tool they were always going to have to update it they were going to always have to invest in it it was going to be a chore and then all that they would have at the end of it was the manual and that's what they would hand to their staff you know here's our design guideline manual follow the manual and he said by adopting envision they get the framework for free somebody else updates it they know it's going to be you know matched with uh the kind of current thinking of the day they get access to a training program to online courses to additional resources and then they become also part of this network so we have a, a ports group so seaports get together and talk about how they're using you know envision and how they're achieving different sustainability goals and i just tell that story because it really speaks to why isi was created that's exactly the story uh, that we were created to to facilitate which is we don't need thousands of agencies spending money and time and resources coming up with their own custom tool like i said we can help out uh, it's it's not going to solve everything uh, but it's a start it can get you on your way. Uh, it can give you these resources. Uh, and you can spend then the agencies, the owners can spend their time and energy actually achieving those sustainability outcomes rather than talking about what they're going to be and, and you know, uh, explaining it to consultants who have to talk to hundreds of other different clients who all have different versions of it. So that's that's really what we were, were going for. And just to wrap up, you know, I, um, I'm an architect by training, so I have to end on pictures. And I usually say pretty pictures, but this is not a pretty picture. This is clearly marked. This is the before, but some Envision projects. This is the historic Fourth Ward Park in Atlanta, Georgia. This is what it was. It was a uh, a derelict site. Obviously, it was an illegal dumping ground. Uh, it would occasionally catch fire. Uh, it would occasionally flood, which I guess was good for putting out the fires, but not good for anything else. So really not a nice site. Uh, and the project was really about the flood management, stormwater management in this area, a lot of water uh, in Atlanta. So, uh, and this is what they built. So this is that prime example of the kind of multi-benefit projects that we're talking about. This is a stormwater management project. It looks like a beautiful park and it is a beautiful park, but it's fundamentally about stormwater management and, and, and water infrastructure. And this is the transformation that we're really seeing in the industry. I often joke that, you know, decades ago, engineers were taught to, to put infrastructure out of sight, out of mind, and they were so good at their jobs that we forgot about it. And there was this perception that infrastructure is dirty, that it's unsafe, that it's unwanted. Uh, we don't want to deal with it. And that's where we get the nimbyism. And, and nobody wants an infrastructure project near them. And it's hard to get funding for infrastructure projects as a result. And we're seeing this trend through multi-benefit projects of bringing infrastructure back into communities, back into the, the vision and the forefront of the minds of our, of our citizens and showing them just the value of what infrastructure does. Not just hearing about the bad things that happen when infrastructure fails, but the good things that happen when we do infrastructure right. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a soapbox that I get on all the time, but it's really wonderful seeing the, the beauty and the value of, of these infrastructures being brought back. This could have been a retention pond with a chain link fence around it, right? But they invested in this and the payback is incredible. When you think about, you know, think about those houses in the background there, right? That you can see they're the same houses. Think about the property values of those houses, of the benefits to them, of the tax revenue that the city will um, receive as a result of the you know, desirability of this neighborhood and economic activity that might happen in stores. And that's, you know, that's just the dollars and cents, but then also you know, the, the beauty and the enjoyment that the people who live here will have. So um, again, you know, we really focus on trying to push these multi-benefit projects we have examples of wastewater treatment facilities where they sunk the tanks and built regulation soccer fields on top of them, you know, and now kids go and they play soccer at the wastewater treatment facility. Things that you wouldn't hear of before, right? When it was just easy to fence it off, block it off, say, don't come here. Um, but again, bringing infrastructure back into our communities and, and showing the value. I also talk about, you know, on the engineering side, some of the work that we need to do because, 
you know, the infrastructure side can be very technical. We're not always good about communicating uh, the, the value uh, of the projects. And then also we tend to focus on the technical solutions that are 98% of the problem or 98% of the cost of the project. But in this case, you know, again, you can imagine there's probably a lot of infrastructure that you're not seeing that's helping with the storm management issues. You're seeing the beautiful part that's on top. Uh, and it's important for us as a profession to remember that it might be the one or 2% of the project or the project budget that the community really sees and values. And that's okay. Uh, how can we work in, you know, one or 2% of a project to really deliver something that a, a community needs? So um, with that, you know, just again, now more just beautiful pictures. Uh, this is a, a wind farm that was envision rated. It's interesting that you may assume wind farms were being renewable energy. Oh, it's, it's easy, it's no problem. They can sometimes uh, face challenges because they, they assume that just by virtue of being a renewable energy project, they get a sustainability award. Uh, but when then when you really dig in on, okay, well, what are the social impacts? What are the environmental impacts? Um, we really push them on that. This is a project in Canada, a biofuel facility. So a, a more unusual project and an example of more of a facility. So we also do facilities like maintenance facilities, industrial facilities, biofuel facilities. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm wrapping up a little bit early because I'm really hoping that we can open up a discussion or, or answer some questions. This is my contact information, so feel free uh, to reach out anytime as well. well. We did set this up so there'd be time for uh, some dialogue, uh, questions and answers, either uh, from those of you who are uh, here in the room or from folks who are um, online. Uh, Anthony can't see us, um, so if you raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone and you can uh, raise any questions. Um, let me just say that uh, uh, early on in the presentation, um, you saw the uh, range of infrastructure areas uh, that, uh, that, uh, this, uh, that this rating system covers. Um, we're going to do one a week um, over the course of uh, the semester and bring in um, uh, case studies uh, to the extent that we can uh, bring uh, folks in. Uh, those of you who are um, here on the Northeastern campus would have noticed uh, that one of the uh, projects um, that uh, was documented here is the ISI bridge, uh, sorry, the ISEC bridge that uh, crosses the uh, commuter rail and orange line tracks uh, to uh, tie together uh, uh, two of the sides of our campus. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, the campus facilities architect who oversaw that project. So uh, we're going to bring her in for one of uh, those um, case study presentations. But if there are uh, questions or comments that folks have, uh, this is uh, your opportunity. Can I ask like two questions quickly as a TA, if I'm allowed? <laughs> OK, go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, uh, it was really interesting um, conversation. Um, so I have two questions. One is, when I saw the, the map that you showed, I clearly see uh, differences between, you know, the north and the global south. So as a CEO and, you know, as a practitioner, what kind of challenges or, you know, barriers that you have seen uh, through implementing Envision? And my second question is about, like, you mentioned about community engagement. So how do you envision kind of engage communities to uh, design these metrics and then how you kind of, you know, measure the progress of different projects by engaging communities. Thank you. Right. Great. Well, on the first one, I can definitely say, so the, uh, you know, part of it is just where we started, you know, so I'm, I'm here in Washington, D.C., and certainly Envision was created with a bit of a North American focus. So, um, you know, the United States and Canada were always, uh, domestic to us. We, we've operated throughout Canada, but even then we've, we've had to work to make sure that Canadian references are accurate and things. So there's a part of it that it's about translation, not just about language translation, but about how infrastructure projects are developed in different parts of the world. I am very proud to say that over the last couple of years, we've worked to translate Envision into Spanish, 
uh, as well as our exam and, and many of our resources. And we've started a relationship with FEMSEC, which is the Mexican Federation of Civil Engineers. So we're, we're very much trying to push sustainability and envision throughout Latin America as well. Um, I did mention our partnership in Italy. So we, there it was a, a fairly easy translation and Envision has done really well under EU regulations. Uh, the only sort of changes that were needed that were actually some of the lower levels of our achievement are, are already too low for EU regulations there. So they have to say, well, you can't really do this. You have to start higher. Uh, but other than that, uh, Envision has been applied really well throughout Europe. So I think the challenge also, you know, so the, I think the rating system works and has been applied in, in countries, uh, many countries mm -hmm. all around the world, not every country, but um, I think it's more about the motivation for why we're pursuing sustainability. So in the US, as I mentioned, we saw cities and counties leading on sustainability, uh, but they didn't have a way of defining it or measuring it. And so we were really stepping into a gap uh, and saying, okay, here's here's what you need to measure uh, sustainability. From our conversations with FEMSEC, I think throughout Latin America, the argument there is that um, these countries really see sustainability as a pathway to attracting foreign investment in infrastructure projects. So I think that's a connection that really has to be made uh, to see sustainability accelerate rapidly. But if we can make that connection, I, again, I think the good news is that uh, things could change very quickly. And in fact, maybe even faster than in the United States. So we're still working on that, but I think that's the biggest change is the drivers behind the, the push towards sustainability. Oh, and then the second question I think you asked was about um, community engagement. That's a really great question because we see that as uh, that, that fundamental question of, are we doing the right project? Well, who gets to decide what the right project is? Uh, and what we came down to is it has to be the community. Um, the community, are, they're gonna use the infrastructure, they're going to be involved in the infrastructure. It has to be something that meshes with their, their needs, their goals, their culture. It can't be this top-down approach of, of technical engineers deciding how uh, a community is gonna live their life, right? Because we've seen that that doesn't really work. So there's a big part of Envision that drives better stakeholder engagement, better community engagement, and we look at the quality of the engagement. So it's not just like the number of public hearings that you have, uh, but you know you start with one-way communication, keeping people informed, but then we work up to two-way communication. Are we really hearing the community and what they need? And does that input make its way into the project? It's one thing to hear the community and say, okay, you have some concerns, but how has that actually influenced the project? And are we changing it? And then at the highest level, have you really engaged someone in the community as a partner? Are they you know, in, um, engaged with this? Are they standing behind it um, in a way uh, that, that really can make the project successful? So that's generally how we look at um, the community and stakeholder engagement, but it's incredibly important. It can't be overlooked. Uh, it's often viewed as a sort of soft and squishy part, uh, but I really challenge that. It's absolutely critical. Yeah, uh, thank you, Antonio. This is very informative um, session. Um, I, I want to ask you to talk a bit about the certification process. Some of the students here are interested in, 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 the, in the certification and the credentials. And also, uh, if possible, talk about research areas that um, will, will help to enhance or increase the spread of uh, envision um, students are also uh, interested in, in doing some kind of applied research. Thank sure, you. yeah. So as far as the credential, uh, and we do have a lot of universities that teach Envision uh, and students who receive the ENVSP credential. Um, so happy to follow up on that. The, the process itself, it's uh, we have either an online course, which is seven hours, seven one hour modules that are asynchronous, self-paced, or we now offer live virtual or in-person training classes as well. Uh, and those are kind of uh, on a more irregular schedule, but it's essentially the same seven to eight hours of education and training. And then there is a 75 question, multiple choice 
exam, but it's done online at home. It's an open note, open book exam. So really it's, it's not to test memorization, but the exam questions are based off of the Envision manual. So you get the question, you then have to go find the relevant source material in the manual and answer the question. And so it's a way for us to know that you understand how to, to use the manual. I'm a, another soapbox that I'll get on, but I'm a, in this professional day and age, I'm a bit against kind of memorization of things when as, as we're working professionals, we always have resources available to us. So it's, you just have to know how to use the tools and resources at hand. Uh, so that's our process. Uh, and then it's an annual credential. So there is uh, ongoing education requirements uh, associated with that. Uh, but we do offer you know, very significant discounts for um, students. Oh, and sorry, the second question was related to research topics. That's why um, applied research. What I see now, which has been really exciting, is uh, embodied uh, carbon. So, um, you know, when Envision was first released, we had a credit on embodied energy, and we got a lot of pushback because at that time people were saying, "You're crazy! You know, you're out of your mind. We're not, we're not doing this." And then in, in version three, four years ago, we changed embodied energy to embodied carbon to make the more direct connection to climate change mitigation. And even then, you know, we still got a lot of pushback. And it is one of the least pursued and achieved credits in Envision. But I think that's because the industry is still coming around. And I've, I've just recently, it seems like every conference, every conversation, someone's talking about embodied carbon. And it's a matter of, we don't know how to calculate it efficiently, how to get the great, the good data, uh, you know, you can do it if you have a PhD and life cycle assessments, but, you know, how do we do it in a way that can be embedded into every single infrastructure project so that we know how to reduce the embodied carbon? I really see that as a, uh, a big research topic coming up because uh, with a lot of infrastructure, it may not have operational energy or carbon emissions, but it might have a lot of embedded carbon through the materials. We're big consumers of concrete and steel. And those are major uh, greenhouse gas emitters. So um, there's a lot of work being done around how do we do that, either through materials, through calculations, through professional practice and, and how we, we do things. So I think that's a, a big topic. And um, as far as others, you know, I think there's still a lot of talk around nature-based solutions uh, and how, the, how we uh, begin to replace some of our gray infrastructure systems with that. And then certainly energy. So next week I'll actually be at a, a hydrogen conference. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research still being done around uh, energy and what's the future of energy. Is it microgrids? Is it hydrogen? Is it better wind or solar? Um, are we going to have better ways of recycling solar and wind? Um, the supply chain issues with some of those renewable sources. So there's a, a number of research topics in, in energy that you can go through. We've got another question. Thank you. I was trying to hurry over. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering for some of the environmental projects, have there been times when, um, have there been times where community members opposed the project because they were worried about green gentrification? Um, I've seen this happen uh, sometimes in lower income communities. So just wondering if your team has come across this while doing outreach and kind of how you went about it. You know, I'm I'm not aware of something down at, at that level of specificity. I would probably hazard a guess that just given the nature of a lot of infrastructure projects, um, it's inevitable that there will be debates and discussion around the projects. That's where we, you know, you can't come down and say that a project needs to have 100% community buy-in or support. Uh, that's where we we focus on the stakeholder engagement and the nature of the conversations that you're having and how do you get to that. But I would agree with you that it's a really critical issue uh, around gentrification. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard one on the infrastructure side because some of that is happening more on the real estate and, and, and building side. Um, so it's, it, it comes at us in different ways. I think often when we look at equity and social justice and in infrastructure, it's who's getting the new stormwater system, right? Whose flooding issues are being addressed first? Is it the affluent uh, neighborhoods that have the time to complain or the, the leverage, right? While, while um, 
economically disadvantaged communities are still dealing with flooding or things like that? Or what's the history of inequity in the infrastructure development? Uh, I was really pleased to see in the uh, infrastructure bill, there's actually a billion dollars for reconnecting communities that were historically disrupted by transportation infrastructure. Uh, when we put in highways and a lot of elevated highways, again, sometimes um, it was a matter of just, you know, you put it in the communities that would cause the least amount of disruption, right, which were uh, economically disadvantaged or immigrant communities that didn't want to, to cause a, a fuss. Uh, but sometimes it was actually done intentionally to disrupt communities. So there's a, there's a legacy with infrastructure development that we have to come uh, to terms with. And I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of steps now being taken to kind of right some of these historic in injustices. So I think that's more than the gentrification side. I think it often comes up more of the how are we uh, providing the infrastructure that the disadvantaged communities need and have historically lacked, if that's, if that's helpful. Uh, just last week, I facilitated a a uh, conference here in Boston that uh, had been put on by uh, the uh, group formerly known as Olmsted Now. They have a new name, um, which of course uh, I'm blocking, but um, I believe that conference on uh, uh, green gentrification um, and displacement, which is uh, the real concern um, uh, underneath gentrification per se, uh, it has been posted on the Emerald Necklace Conservancy uh, website, so you can take a look at that. Uh, it's um, obviously a big issue here in Boston where um, efforts are being made to um, expand the scope of open and green spaces um, and to address some of the issues that uh, have come up in neighborhoods like East Boston. Uh, around uh, uh, putting in a power plant. Um, and uh, in any uh, community where you already have issues uh, around uh, insufficient uh, affordable housing and the like, um, but you also have uh, uh, issues around infrastructure, uh, you know you need to do the infrastructure work. You know that most of that infrastructure work um, is going to uh, end up beautifying the neighborhood at some level. Um, and that there may well be some displacement around that. So the question becomes one of how you mitigate that and also how you engage people from the outset um, in uh, laying out what they would like to see um, as benefits that would accrue to the existing community um, so that uh, folks do not get pushed out. Um, and I've often pointed to the uh, Suffolk Downs approval um, and project which uh, is going on in Boston, in East Boston, um, as one of the examples locally that one can look at um, to see what the uh, offsets and mitigation can be uh, when a, a project comes in and uh, then ends up at least in part beautifying the neighborhood. That's a really good point. Um... And I, I would also add, I, I know here in DC through my work on the commission and our resilience planning, there's also a lot of work to make sure that as through the sustainability transitions that we're gonna see that you provide jobs and training to transition workforce, that's a big part of it as well. So here, uh, the biggest program we have is around solar installation, but trying to provide jobs for historically disadvantaged communities in the district um, as they push solar so that they're kind of marrying workforce development with their investments in renewable energy. I think that's important as well. Uh, hello, my name is Harrison and I come from a civil engineering background. I was curious how you imagine the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, the role that Envision will have uh, currently and how it may evolve with projects that receive uh, federal, state and local funding. So there's no direct involvement currently, other than um, lots of mechanisms of the infrastructure bill will have funding that just goes straight down to the state and local level. So um, there, if the communities are using Envision, we'll see a lot of that money going towards more sustainable infrastructure, um, but if not, not. So there's no direct connection there. 
we are trying to work now as much as we can being a small organization uh, to help push sustainability within some of the federal agencies that are going to be making decisions. One small one is, uh, I mentioned the hydrogen conference. We're, we're trying to work with the Department of Energy. There's about $8 billion in the bill that will go towards hydrogen pilot hubs uh, and trying to work with them to incorporate maybe some of the principles of Envision into their screening process so that we can try to push greater sustainability outcomes for those hydrogen projects and maybe even use sustainability as a selection, again, selection criteria for who will win those bids and therefore make it a more competitive. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done, um, but it'll mostly be decided at that, that local level. I, there is a lot in the bill that is earmarked for things that fall under the umbrella of sustainability. There's a lot in environmental remediation, a lot in improving our water infrastructure systems. And as I mentioned, you know, the billion dollars for reconnecting communities. Um, there are other different earmarks uh, within it. I can't rattle them all off the top of my head. I have a list somewhere, but there, there are some good pieces in that bill that earmark certain funds for sustainability, um, but no direct connection to Envision at this time. And I'll also note on the local level, um, I'm not yet aware uh, of how transformations in Boston's uh, planning structure um, will um, open up some opportunities for use of um, Envision as, as a way of assessing impacts. But this is a moment um, in, in the Commonwealth where uh, with a uh, still a relatively new mayor and a new governor, um, there will be opportunities to uh, introduce different ways of assessing some of the long-term impacts uh, of the uh, infrastructure investment that's imminent. So another yeah, question. Hi, uh, my name is Mega Prasad, and I come from, I guess, a municipal finance background. Um, I'm curious as to how ISI and Envision interacts with things like SASB or Sustainalytics or Ecovatis and like these kind of like third party verification organizations that exist within that space. Um, I feel like there should be crossover, but I'm just curious what your interaction with them is. You know, it's fairly limited. You know, there's sustainability frameworks for for you know every aspect uh, that you can think of. We come a little bit more from the planning, design, and construction side. Uh, my hope is that we will, you know, connect with those financial uh, tools and models more. Um, the one that I'm more connected in with is GRESP, the, the um, Real Estate and Accounting Reporting Index. Uh, but um, I, I think we'll see more and more of those coming together. The financial side of it does have a big downstream influence. So like on our side, if we can say that a sustainable project is in any way connected to either, you know, a better bond rating or better interest rates or, or anything, uh, that can really drive performance on, on our end. And as I mentioned in Latin America, I think the, the international investment community um, will be a big driver there. I'm not familiar with all of the tools you mentioned, I apologize, but I do think it's really important. Just anecdotally, it was interesting. We, we work a lot with LA Metro, uh, which is the Metro system for LA County. And they put their finance department through the Envision training. Uh, and I, it was interesting, you know, because it's not really designed for that, but they found it was really helpful to have their internal accounting and finance department understanding why projects were doing what they were doing, why elements, you know, costs were being incurred uh, to improve the sustainability of projects. So it seemed to work out really well for them. Uh, and, and so, yes, yeah, so I think we all need to kind of hold hands. We're all just, we're tools in a toolbox. You know, Envision is one tool. You're going to have other tools for finance departments, but ideally they all work together. Do we know if we have any, uh, and I see one other question in the back, but do we know if we have any uh, questions from people who've been looking at this online? I have to check on that. Hi, um, my name is Adam. I work in transit facility infrastructure um, on my day-to-day. -day. Um, and my question is, uh, in terms of NIMBYism, um, have you seen that environmental guidelines are having something, uh, regulations put in place 
as an opportunity for folks who have more affluence or more wealth to weaponize those regulations to prevent infrastructure from being built, um, namely infrastructure that they don't want to see or isn't. Sorry, I'm thinking Cape Wind, for example. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a really interesting thought. You know, I don't want to speak uh, out of turn on something that I'm not really informed about, um, but I think you 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 certainly have a, a, a position there that I think you you know makes sense in terms of. Um, you know who can understand the regulations, right? And who can has the time to to work those angles? In my day to day life, I, I see it mostly as really passionate environmental advocates who who use it in order to protect our, our natural resources and things. So uh, I don't personally uh, see it being weaponized, but that's certainly not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, I, so I mean, there's a good point there that we also have a lot of work to do as far as how we communicate around these environmental protections and the benefits, right? And it can't just all be legalese and really highbrow conversations. Um, we, we need to find a way to communicate uh, to every uh, impacted individual in a way that uh, is very real for them. Um, so, sorry, I can't really answer your question too much, but I think you have a really interesting position uh, that could probably uh, be worked out in a, in a great paper. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a tremendous amount of research to be done on that. I also can't think of uh, another example other than Cape Wind, but that's a perfect example because, uh, uh, you know, there was uh, the support of a senator um, and, and the project was delayed by, what, a decade, decade and a half. Um, and uh, finally, it's coming into fruition. Um, but I'm sure that must be happening in in uh, other parts of the country. And I have a sense that uh, some, of that's, um, some of that approach is being used by opponents of um, other windmill and, and uh, uh, wind-driven projects. You know, they're, they're the issues that are raised about the birds and the noise and uh, those kinds of issues to uh, uh, delay moving forward with these kinds of necessary projects. And I would just add, you know, whether it happens intentionally, frequently or not, I do think it happens unintentionally quite frequently. Uh, I think there are, you know, communities that will raise objections and 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 the problem rolls downhill until it finds no resistance, right? Uh, I think that happens far more often than, than any of us are particularly um, excited about. Uh, and that maybe hits on my other issue, which is, if we can flip the script and make these infrastructure investments assets to their community, like the park I showed, or like the soccer field on top of the water treatment facility, now all of those uh, communities that were saddled with these, these infrastructure assets that were uh, unwanted or unsafe or disruptive, now they will receive the benefits of, of rejuvenating those projects and making assets and, and things that will benefit those communities. I think the point about gentrification certainly needs to be addressed as well. It should be tied to property ownership and things like that. But um, I think we can make infrastructure something that's desirable and it, it needs to start with the most disadvantaged or those who have been historically disadvantaged. Uh, the sustainability revolution shouldn't start in the affluent neighborhoods. Um, so I think that's, uh, well, I'm sorry, that might be a bit controversial to me, mind, but uh, I, I, you know, I think it needs to start with those who have been historically disadvantaged by our infrastructure investments. Yeah, and let's not forget that uh, some of our most beloved open spaces at this moment started uh, as infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, the Emerald Necklace itself was initially a, a water flow and, and sewer treatment project. Um, and there are a number of other uh, open spaces and parks in Boston um, that essentially uh, started as uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, the opening of the river in Providence, uh, it was an in infrastructure uh, project that has contributed substantially uh, to economic development in downtown Providence. So it, it, it's a question of how we characterize the work that we know needs to be done around infrastructure so that it's viewed as attractive uh, for uh, folks who are not just sanitation engineers.
I think we have one last. Hi, my name is Parul and I'm an architect. Now I'm doing construction management. As a student, I want to know what are the specific certification courses related to sustainability and technology, which will make my portfolio to stand out and also which will help me in my career as a construction project manager. Also, I want to be in the designing team and also I want to work as a manager too. Like I want to know what are the specific certification courses. Oh, that's that's a tough one, and I, I feel like I'm self-serving if I say the admission <laughs> one. But um, you know, I, I the good thing is I don't think there is a prescribed set of of certifications that you need. Uh, sustainability right now really permeates everything. So I think for your chosen pathway, as you've laid out, I would look for the certifications then within each of those. So, you know, so if you're interested in construction, I'm sure you can find construction sustainability certification or education resources or things like that. And, and then really market yourself as a, a leader in those concepts. Um, it's still, it's one of the, I think since I'm maybe to end on this, uh, since I'm speaking to a, a student audience, this is a really exciting field because it's so new. Uh, and because there aren't all of these prescribed certifications that you have to get. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to get a Nobel Prize in chemistry, I'd say you probably needed to start a few years ago already. Um, but in sustainability, there's still a lot of room for advancement, for creating new pathways, for creating new careers almost in this field. Um, to be a sustainability link between design and construction, as you it sounds like you were talking about. That could be a, a job and a role that you create for yourself in, in an organization. And the great thing being that as uh, younger people, uh, there's not a lot of legacy uh, positions being filled by the older generations in, in these fields. You're kind of new, um, you know, in my generation, my background was in architecture. When I was a student, building information modeling was just happening. And it was a way for a, a younger architect or younger designer to, to take a leadership role well ahead of schedule within a firm or a company because you had those skills and resources. So I think sustainability can be a similar pathway for many of you. Um, it's, it's a great way to, to push your career, to be a leader within the company that you're gonna be joining um, because you know, even if they've been doing it, they've probably, they haven't been doing it for decades. Um, it's still relatively new and they're, they're going to appreciate that. So I know that was a bit of a dodge on your question. I, I can't help you with more on the specific certifications, but I, I do think this is a, a great field for, um, for students to be researching and, and ultimately entering their career under. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, it was just last night that I uh, facilitated a uh, conference um, of architects, builders, uh, designers, um, and, and I had to tell them the story, um, which, which I always tell with a bit of embarrassment, that um, I went to an American Institute of Architects National Convention uh, just about a decade ago in Denver. And um, uh, former Vice President Al Gore was the keynote speaker. Um, and when he came out on stage and started to talk about his work um, on uh, energy management and the environment, a substantial number of people in that AIA audience booed him. The, the design professions have been through cycles. There was a period in the 60s and early 70s when people like Ian McHarg and the like were tied in with uh, green design and uh, you know coastal management and the like. And then folks sort of went away. Um, saying that their uh, clients weren't uh, asking for those skill sets or those kinds of buildings, primarily because the impression was that a building green um, uh, or resilient uh, was going to add substantially to the cost of the project. Um, and so the firms didn't staff up with those kinds of people. Now the handful of people who had those skill sets have reached retirement age. And so when you as, as an emerging uh, designer show up and uh, at the very uh, top or front of your portfolio is work that reflects this sensibility plus the technical skill um, that, that's needed to uh, work in this area, you're gonna get hired. 
the, the firms just don't have enough talent um, in, in this regard. So um, whether it's project management or the engineering side or, or the sustainability piece, um, make sure that you engage with projects that focus on this and then incorporate them into your portfolios. Um, I, I wanted to add, um, as, as an engineer, I think I'm very excited uh, that um, Envision talk about social justice and equity as a requirement in project. I think uh, this, is, this is a new area because um, the concern usually, the technical concern within the engineering discipline. Uh, I, I wonder, Anthony, if you can give us uh, an example or, or two of how uh, this criteria is kind of um, measured. What do you ask uh, project uh, managers or contractors to provide as evidence that they have addressed uh, social justice and equity? Sure. And, you know, this is, it's a real challenge because when we were doing the research on, on these requirements, you know, the number one kind of feedback that we got from some of the experts was, equity and social justice is not something that you sort of achieve. It's not a, a destination that you arrive at and say, check the box, we're done, especially at the, the level of an individual infrastructure project. It's a process, right? We're working towards equity and social justice. So the requirements are built similarly to say, how are we working towards that better solution? It starts at the very uh, beginning with just having kind of fundamental equity requirements with the parties involved, right? As far as uh, uh, things like equal pay or, or different commitments on equity within companies, the companies that are involved, because you can't, you can't be expected to lead this process if you yourselves as an organization are not kind of living the issues of equity and social justice within your own organization. Then we ask them to understand the history and the context of the project itself. So what is this project? Where is it going? And again, what's that history of, of infrastructure and equity within that community? And then is your project helping address some of those or not? Uh, and so we just kind of walk them through the process uh, that way. Yeah, I would just add that um, what amounts to um, a commitment to the legacy that you're leaving uh, in that community that demonstrates uh, a long-term commitment to social justice. So that means, among other things, uh, workforce training for young people from the community. Uh, it means um, looking at uh, the impact that the project might have on uh, existing small businesses. Um, it, it looks at uh, the way uh, the project uh, addresses issues of displacement. Um, and uh, sustaining people uh, in the community uh, and not just um, providing the benefit for uh, more affluent um, uh, or more politically powerful individuals. We, we're at our time. Um, we're going to spend uh, the rest of this semester uh, uh, going deep on uh, each of these issues and bringing to you uh, project examples uh, of uh, uh, where this has been applied. It is our hope um, and, and really our expect, expectation um, that folks will apply critical thinking uh, to all of these sessions. This is a new field uh, and it, it's evolving rapidly and it needs critique as well as presentation. Um, so uh, our hope is that uh, you will engage, as you have tonight, raising some hard questions uh, around um, how this is applied, how it's measured, um, and, and what we want to see uh, in the long term in terms of uh, uh, achieving uh, success with projects uh, that once would have been just considered uh, a bit of engineering infrastructure um, that was developed by uh, some uh, very smart project managers into something uh, akin to what we saw uh, in the Atlanta project, where there's really uh, a highly desirable long-term benefit 
uh, that can both be projected um, and uh, which becomes evidence um, of the value of uh, a lot of the investment we're about to see. So, um, Abdul, anything else? I, I want to thank Anthony um, for for accepting the invitation and for uh, your generous support. Um, definitely, we'll come back to you uh, because we are going to do a different session on these different infrastructure throughout the semester. So, thank you um, for your recommendations and for your support. And I also want to thank every one of you here for attending and hope to see you um, in coming sessions. Thank you very much. All right.